I want to take you guys through a, a couple of different stories. I will work through sort of things that I've done throughout my career and then take you through to a bunch of sort of new things that we're playing with. So it's by no means a complete story or a full story. So if there are questions, uh, once we get to that, just throw a hand up. And if I am being confusing at any point um, during the presentation, please do stop me. I, I lecture all the time to students, and I don't mind at all if you raise a hand and I can clarify something. I'd much rather you ask rather than fall asleep. Brilliant. So I'm going to talk about RNA localization today. And we know that local, translational, uh, local translation is a conserved mechanism. And it's across all types of animals that have been studied. And this includes things like yeast, um, sea snails, to xenopus, to mice. Um, and we know that defects in RNA localization um, and their translational control can lead to all types of different diseases, including lethality in many cases. Um, we also see that it's important in humans um, for localized translation plays a role in fragile X syndrome, which is a mental retardation syndrome, as well as Alzheimer's, uh, learning and memory, and developments of different types of cancers. So I just want to take you through sort of a, a review or a bit of a quick textbook version of what the biological roles of localized RNAs are. So when I mean localized RNA, this is RNA that's being transcribed in the nucleus and exported. And then instead of being translated, as it enters into the cytoplasm, as many uh, RNAs are, it gets packaged and, and moved to a certain region. And then it can be held there for long periods of time prior to then the translational activation. And some examples uh, include things like asymmetric division. So in this example here, this is in the neuroblast uh, of a Drosophila, and we get two RNAs localized to different, uh, one to the apical side and one to the basal side of this dividing cell. And so here, Inscutable and Prospero are localizing, and that then leads to a change in the cell uh, fate decisions. So one goes on to become a renewed uh, neuroblast. The other goes on to become what's called a ganglion mother cell. Other examples, which you'll hear quite a bit about today, are localized determinants. So we see this in Drosophila and in Xenopus. And here's an example from zebrafish, where we see different RNAs are localized to the animal versus the vegetal sides of the developing oocyte. And this is going to be important then to pattern the entire oocyte uh, and to pattern the embryo post-fertilization. Some great examples from cell migration and motility. And in the one I've selected here, what you can see, in fact, is that a gradient can be read. And so what we have here is a growth cone, and the gradient uh, of nectrin is being detected, and it's leading to local translation of the actin RNA. And that allows the growth cone then to turn right, and to follow uh, towards the attractant. We see the same in, in fibroblasts uh, for migrating chicken fibroblasts. And then one of the really cool things that's been emerging recently deals with synaptic plasticity. And in the case of synaptic plasticity, we have RNAs that are moving uh, through the dendrite. And when they get to a dendri dendritic spine that's actually been activated by a synapse, that's where you get local translation. And you can start to see just how powerful this is as a mechanism for local protein expression. So because we're getting an activity, and because we're actually building this, this synapse here, we get the local translation that can then lead to the spine, uh, spine morphogenesis and also then the, the elaboration of this nervous system. And just in case you guys are interested in other, um, other types of cells, RNA localization functions in bacteria where we actually see it uh, localizing certain RNAs to these poles. And that's important for what's called horizontal gene transfer, which you may have met previously, where genes can be exchanged um, through these connective sites. We also see it in fungus. There's a, a great model system looking at RNA localization and local um, translation. And this is from a corn fungus. And it can actually move on endosomes out to the poles. And then in disease, as I mentioned before, we see it um, in human diseases like cancer, we see it in MS as well. Um, and it's, 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 it's been shown more and more now to be important. Here are some of the classic examples, which we may, uh, at the cellular level, uh, just introduce you to. This is ASH1 in budding yeast. And you can see that ASH1 RNA localizes here, and its protein is made in one of the two cells. And this is in the daughter cell. And it's going to be important then to control um, what the mating type switching is. So in the daughter cell will not switch, but the 
mother's cell will. So this is an example again of this um, asymmetric localization leading to <clears throat> different cell fates at division. We see it also in, uh, here's a, a nice example of PKP4 localizing to the tips of these philopodia. Here's the beta actin RNA in a chicken fibroblast. Um, you see it in these sea snails. Here's VEG1 as well in Xenopus uh, oocytes. And as I mentioned, we're seeing more and more RNAs being localized in the nervous system. And here's an example of CAMK2. And the question that I've been interested in now pretty much since I started graduate school and what I've been working on now uh, with my own lab is how are these RNAs regulated in time and space? So if you take anything away from the talk, it's absolutely essential, especially when we talk about developmental biology, that we have these RNAs controlled or regulated not only in space, so where they are, but also the second half of when they're being translated. If you remember a little bit about RNA, it's not only the translation, but then it's the degradation that's also going to be important. So it really is the life of the RNA has to be really exquisitely controlled. And one of the best systems to look at that in is in Drosophila. So we, we know more about localizing RNAs in Drosophila than any other system that exists. And some of the classic examples um, are looking at things like uh, Bicoid RNA localizing to the anterior and Nanos and Oscar RNA localizing to the posterior. And what happens during oogenesis or the formation of this egg, we can see here at late oogenesis you get these really dynamic events of the oocyte will start to stream and these nurse cells here will empty their cytoplasm in to the oocyte. Um, I'll take you through the example of what all these cells are in a moment. When you then get to the end or to the mature egg, you basically have one uh, example of RNA here, bicoid at the anterior and nanos at the posterior. They're both translationally controlled. They're both being kept off for the most part. And they're waiting for the events of fertilization to then launch into uh, embryogenesis. So one of the first questions we have to ask is how can you actually follow an RNA? How can you see? an RNA um, in vivo. Now, historically, people use things like in situ hybridization. So you use a probe that's going to then bind to the RNA. But in that case, you have to fix the tissue. In other cases, people would inject in vitro synthesized RNA. So they use labeled UTPs to then get an RNA that's going to fluoresce or have some type of dye on it. But in that case, you're physically entering into the cells or the tissue. And that can cause quite a bit of damage. We also know that the RNA hasn't been packaged properly. So a system that was developed by Rob Singer's lab in 1998 in yeast, and then really pushed by Liz Gavis's lab, has, has offered a great option in order to follow RNA in vivo, live, with endogenous transcripts. And the way this system works, it involves two components. The first is an RNA component, and it involves the endogenous promoter, the RNA transcript, um, or, well, the pre-RNA, and copies of what are called the MS2 bacteriophage RNA stem loop. So we're going to use uh, a bacteriophage, which is going to form the caspid with the uh, RNA protein interactions. We're going to take advantage of that RNA loop protein interaction in order to tag the RNA. So for our RNA of interest, we insert these stem loops into the three prime UTR. So that's one component or one transgene. Then the second component is going to be the MS2 coat protein fused to a fluorescent protein. So when we co-express both of these components in the same cells or in the same tissue, the coat protein will bind to the stem loops and thus decorate the RNA with a fluorescent protein. And so it's quite clever in that way. And in this example, I've shown you now the stem loop is bound by the coprotein, and we see that we now have RFP labeling these RNA. Now, if the protein does not bind, there's a nuclear localization signal that's been engineered. And what that means is all the excess fluorescence gets taken to the nucleus. So that gives us enough signal to noise to then be able to see the transcript in the cytoplasm. And here's some examples. This is bicoid RNA, and this was the first time that we'd actually seen it moving 
within the, a living, developing egg chamber. And you can see the RNA actually zipping around here at a short distance. And even at the anterior pole, you can notice that those particles are quite dynamic. And they're changing, not only in X and Y, but also in their Z plane. We could also then take and look at individual particles. And you see something quite fascinating in terms of RNA localization here. You see a particle moving in one direction, pausing for a split second, and then moving in a totally different direction. And this is very suggestive of what we call an active transport. So using a molecular motor on a track to move a cargo. We knew that was the case based on the other experiments we did. But here what's quite cool is it looks like it's changing tracks, as if it's turning right or turning left. And we were able then to work out um, in, in the papers that we, we published on this as a, when I was a PhD student, sort of the mechanism and the movement for the localization of Bicoid. And one of the more satisfying things that have ever happened to me, <laughs> scientifically speaking, was last year, Daniel St. Johnston's lab in Cambridge as well, who's been working on Bicoid for 40 years now, um, they effectively published a paper that reiterated effectively what we had found 10 years before. And so they show that Bicoid RNA gets localized in a ring at, at the middle stages, and then it transitions to being sort of at a, uh, in a disk, what they call a disk here at the anterior. And by the end, that anterior localized RNA is being packaged into these regions where it's translationally off. And what you can see then, they also found that there is this movement of the RNA in different directions, similar to what we were showing in the last movie. So I need to now introduce you a little bit to the egg chamber itself. How many of you have looked, worked with Drosophila? All right, I'll only talk to that side of the room then. <laughs> so the Drosophila egg chamber, or the, the model system that we're using here, it, it involves 15 nurse cells. So these are the large nuclei here. These, um, they're polypoid nuclei. And these 15 cells are interconnected with a 16th cell, which is the oocyte. So at the stem cell stage, it has four rounds of division and incomplete cytokinesis. So we get these actin-rich rings, what are called ring canals, that link together those 16 cells. And what that means is these RNA and protein being produced by these supporting nurse cells are able then to empty that cytoplasm and these factors into the developing oocyte. And it's surrounded then by a follicle layer of cells. And these are somatically derived. So our 16 cell cyst is germline derived, and our follicle cells around the outside, encapsulating the outside, are uh, somatically derived. And this whole thing is termed the egg chamber. So we can see that there's examples of an RNA, Bicoid here in blue, and Gherkin here in green, both localizing to similar regions along the anterior, with Gherkin localizing to the dorsal anterior. And this Gherkin RNA gets translated it's a transforming growth factor. So this TGF alpha protein is then secreted to these follicle cells, who then signal back to the oocyte um, later on into the embryo, and actually define the dorsal ventral body axis. So if you lose Gherkin, you don't get a dorsal ventral axis. And so development is completely lost. Dorsal being uh, your back ventral being the stomach. And so the embryo is just all twisted up. It looks like someone uh, spun it around. Um, I'm trying to think what kind of pasta it looks like. It looks like, um, like a fazuli. You have that here? Yeah. So it's all spun. G genuinely, it does. It, it, it looks horrific. And if you lose bicoid RNA, you lose the head. Yeah. So the head and, and parts of the thorax are gone. So these RNAs have to be localized in the right place and at the right time. Otherwise, we, we see these really grim phenotypes. So in order to then, we, we, we'd done some work seeing how they were localized. We wanted to understand how they're being regulated in terms of translation. And the translational control in the oocyte, the discovery we made that was key, was using electron microscopy. So this is cryo-immuno electron microscopy on ultra-thin frozen sections, which is a lot of words. <laughs> so the cryo part means it's frozen. So these sections are being cut at, 100, at minus 120 degrees Celsius by a diamond tip knife 
and we're getting 60 nanometers, nanometer, thick sections. Then we probe those sections using uh, uh, an antisense RNA, right? That's then going to be an in situ hybridization effectively. And we conjugate then to gold beads. So we can see where the RNA is, and the gold bead is, is electron dense, and it gives you these little particles that you can see. So here is a five nanometer particle. So there's three particles in that circle, maybe one there. And then in the larger examples, we see these are 15 nanometer gold. And so by doing this, we're able to then look at where the RNA are. So here's bicoid RNA, and it's inside this dark region, which you can see, and I've, I've highlighted here with the uh, dashed line. And then you look at gherkin RNA, and you notice it's sitting on what we termed the edge of these regions. And then finally, you can see ribosomes. And the, inside these electron-dense areas, we see very, very few ribosomes. Most of this is actually considered background. And you see many, many ribosomes here out in the cytoplasm. And these regions, where we know translational regulation is occurring, are known as processing bodies. So processing bodies were first um, articulated in yeast, and they're important zones for RNA metabolism. They are not bound by a membrane, so they're not a classic organelle. And there's a ton of work, and I, I didn't put it in, it's a lot of fluid dynamics and a lot of biophysics now. In the last three years, there's been a number of papers coming out in reviews looking at how these form and what their actually their structure is and what they're, they're liquid, solid, or gel-like. And the transition between these has actually been shown to be really important um, for not only regulating the RNA, but also regulating what protein contents are inside. So what we see is that bicoid RNA, which we know is not being translated, is inside of the processing body. And nanos, which is being translated, at the stage I'm showing you, is at the edge of the processing body. And we were able then to confirm this with electro, um, this electron work, electron microscopy work, with fluorescence microscopy. And this is in uh, collaboration with Micron Oxford, and this is super resolution microscopy, which gives us uh, able to break the, um, uh, the, the resolution limit of light, which is 200 nanometers. And we're getting this down to around 120 nanometers. And you can see that bicoid is co-localizing with our P-body marker, bicoid being in red and our P-body marker being here in green, whereas gherkin is basically intercalated between the green of the P-body and the red of the RNA. And we worked out a number of other aspects of it, lots of measurements, lots of analysis, uh, even some live work, and we come up with a working model. So how can we regulate differential translation, and we say that we see the RNA being localized to the edge, and at the edge it's able to come into contact with ribosomes as well as initiation factors, and that then leads to translation. Whereas other RNA can be deposited in the center of the P-body and kept there, and that then blocks the translation. So this is sort of the working model that, that we're off of. Now, how is the RNA then, if we look at the next question, how is it only being translated within the, the oocyte? So we know it's moving from these nurse cells here, and we know it needs to get localized, and we don't want to have translation during the localization phase, because what that would mean is, especially in the case of gherkin, we're going to have gherkin being translated in the wrong place. It's then going to signal to these follicle cells. That's going to then lead to a signal back and that's going to then cause the wrong body axis to form, which would create quite a bit of a problem, you might imagine. So we wanted to then understand what's going on in these nurse cells and in the oocyte during transport that's different. So what's different about these particles of RNA? Why aren't they being translated? And the classic model would be the presence of a repressor. Right? So have something bind to the RNA to keep it off. So we went through, actually, with gherkin RNA, and we are now labeling for gherkin protein. So this is the assay that we're using to show that there was translation. And we see that if we do this in different types of mutants, so this is in what's known as a squid mutant. The names are not important. These are just different proteins that have been found to bind to the RNA and to lead to um, problems in the RNA 
uh, localization and translation. And we also looked at a number of other ones. And when you look at the wild type, you get this nice translation of the RNA just up the dorsal anterior corner by the nucleus. And you don't see anything in the nurse cells. And if the prediction is correct that a repressor is binding to the RNA and keeping it off, then when we do these mutants, we would expect to see it on in the nurse cells. But as you can see from the data, that's not the case. We see it at the nucleus again, and squid is an example of a localization protein. And so you also see translation happening within the oocyte, but at the wrong corner. So this is in now the ventral anterior corner. So this tells us that within the oocyte, we can have translation when we lose this repressor. However, in the nurse cells, we're still not getting translation, even though the repressors are gone. So then we were really stuck for a bit. We weren't really sure then what could be regulating this blocking of translation within the nurse cells. And the breakthrough came, again, when we went back to these old EM grids that we had. And we noticed that in the nurse cells, there was very little of a protein called ORB. Now, ORB is a translational activator. Right? It's, a, it's a cytoplasmic polyadenylation binding protein. So those of you who are familiar with translation, RNAs get polyadenylated. That allows a scaffold for proteins to bind, which then leads to uh, a way for ribosomes basically to come in and for rapid translation. And in this example, you can see here that within the nurse cells, there's very few particles of orb, this translational activator, on the Peabody, again circled in the dotted line. Whereas here, you see a ton of, uh, of orb within the Peabody's in the oocyte. So this then led us to propose our hypothesis being that the translation of Gherkin RNA is controlled by the access to the RNA uh, binding protein orb, or the translational activator orb. So to test this then, we would need to drive orb expression in those nurse cells. And we would then say, do we see translation? So in the wild type example, again, we see Gherkin protein only here in the nurse, in the, sorry, in the oocyte at the dorsal anterior. When we overexpress orb, which is normally not on in the nurse cells, but we can drive it using a, a genetic trick from Drosophila, we can see, in fact, that now Gherkin protein is present. And you can actually see it being secreted to the membranes. And then in an even better example, we use a repressor of orb. And if we knock out the repressor of orb, then we get the orb expression. And what you can see here is now Gherkin is being translated and secreted to the membranes of these nurse cells. <coughs> right? So it's the presence of this translational activator in the oocyte that allows the RNA to be translated. And if we overexpress it and drive it in the nurse cells, we also see translation. And I had mentioned to you a moment ago about the edge, right? that the RNA is being translated at the edge. And so what we wanted to finally ask was, is this principle holding true within the nurse cells? So that localization to the edge of the Peabody. And what you can see here is, this is the Peabody marker in green and our translational activator in red. And they are showing up at the edge with each other. And then, within the wild type, in the nurse cells, you see that the RNA in red is not associating with the Peabody. However, when we overexpress the translational activator orb, we now see, and this is a single molecule fish, you see the RNA is now present on the edge of these Peabodies. We see about 60% of the RNA going to the edge. So this again suggests very strongly, when we look at a model here, that in the nurse cells, the RNA is, is alone. It's not associating with the Peabodies. Then when it passes in to the oocyte, it's going to associate with Peabodies and come into contact with orb, which we know is localized to the Peabodies. And at the edge of these processing bodies, where we know translation can occur, we will then see the RNA being made into protein. And we've gone on further. I won't tell you about it. But what's activating orb locally at the dorsal anterior corner, we've actually found to be a protein called CK2, 
which is an enzyme that's going to be uh, phosphorylating oil. And all of what I've been able to show you here is based on looking at the protein being expressed. But as an RNA biologist, we're really desperately trying to do something else, which is we'd love to see translation in vivo. So this is really, uh, would be a remarkable thing to watch the RNA get translated. And how can we do that? It's not trivial. <laughs> but last year, actually a year and a half ago now, a system was published in cells. We've now adapted it. Um, Lana Frusi um, from EMBL has been able to show it also works in Drosophila, and that was part of this paper. And now she's built these constructs, and I'm collaborating with her in the lab with Frank Whippich as well to follow translation in vivo. And the way this system works takes us back to those MS2 stem loops, that bacteriophage interaction that I mentioned earlier. So we still have our RNA, we have our coding sequence. We've engineered the MS2 stem loops into the 3' UTR. So this is very similar to what I showed you before to tag the RNA. But the clever part here is that they've also engineered what are called PP7 stem loops. So this is just another way of having an RNA protein interaction. But they've engineered this into the coding region. So here's your stop codon. And you have these loops, which will bind then to their coat protein labeled in one color within the coding region and then this other set of loops and its binding uh, proteins within the 3' UTR. And what that means is when the ribosome comes through, it's going to knock off these proteins, but it's not going to touch these protein RNA interaction because of the stop codon. So that means that the RNA will change from yellow, because it has both colors, both proteins bound, to red, following the pioneer round of translation. So this gives us the first opportunity to follow the first round of translation in vivo. And the reason we were so keen on looking at this is, as I mentioned to you before, we know that bicoid RNA, right, the anterior determinant, is inside of those P-bodies. So what happens to allow it to become translated? And here I can show you what happens when the egg begins the process um, just prior to fertilization called activation. So here are the P bodies, and we've activated this egg, what we call ex vivo, and you can see the P bodies effectively disperse and fall apart. Hopefully you, you, you're seeing that in this movie that's looping. So there they go, they just disperse and fall apart. And we were able to then look at the RNA and the P body, and we see that they're no longer overlapping here in the embryo. And this is when we know the RNA is being expressed. So we wanted to take this trick system and now start to make some manipulations, start to see what factors are going to be important, and, and can the system work to show us when translation is being initiated. So the first point is, is the RNA off in the mature oocyte? So here you see untranslated RNA will have both the magenta and, uh, and the green. And so they're together now, and you see all these white particles. Yeah. Those are untranslated RNA because they have both sets of stem loops. Same thing here, untranslated now is going to be in yellow. But after we activate the egg, you'll notice very quickly that now we don't have any green associated with the RNA. And that means we've gone through the first round of translation. We've knocked off those proteins that are in the coding region. As a uh, control, which is always going to be essential, we've used cyclohexamide, and that results then in the maintaining of the two colors, which means the RNA has not been translated. The ribosomes have not been able to move through, and so we see that that actually remains yellow on the same amount of time. We've also gone through now, and we're doing different, uh, we're putting in different uh, genetic backgrounds, and we're actually able to see uh, what enzymes are going to be important. There's a key one, if you're interested, I can talk to you about later, called Pangu, which we've seen, in fact, blocks translation as it was predicted based on some bioinformatics work. So we've seen now that Bicoid is translated. So the next question that we have is, what's regulating this translation? So I told you about Gherkin, and I've shown you that, in fact, it's the presence of this activator Right? and the association with the edge of these P-bodies that enables us to get the translation of the RNA. 
But in the case of Bitcoin, we know that it's being translated between the last stage of oogenesis and the beginning of, uh, of embryogenesis, known as egg activation. So the question being, what's allowing this RNA to disperse and what's allowing this RNA to form protein gradient? And this is the famous Bitcoin protein gradient that goes from the anterior to the posterior and was the first, first morphogen to be defined. Morphogens being at different concentrations, they give different effects on the cells. And this has been worked on for many, many years now. Um, and we really still don't understand what's controlling the RNA actually being translated, even after the 40 years that people have known about this. So there's a number of pieces of data that, that started to suggest a certain possible mechanism. So old work from, uh, from 1994 suggested it was polyadenylation. So it's the extension of the poly A tail. And what you can see here is that the poly A tail in the oocyte is at one length and it gets longer as you go uh, later into the early embryo. Another example was the presence of what's called WISPI, which is going to be a polyadenylation protein. So this is the protein that's going to be required to build that poly A tail. And this is where things were for many years, until relatively recently, um, the Bartel lab has done a lot of um, really beautiful work. And what they were able to show, in fact, is that the Bitcoin 3 prime UTR, uh, the Bitcoin 3 prime UTR, this polyadenylation, is not that much longer. So in fact, it's not simply polyadenylation that, that could be doing this. At least they proposed that. And this got us thinking about the fact also that in pea bodies, we have lots of really interesting proteins, including things like argonaut and microRNAs. And we started thinking about whether or not microRNAs might be involved in this process. And people really hadn't looked at this very much at all yet. So the first step we did to assess whether or not microRNAs might be playing a role was to actually do an RNA-seq. And we broke these egg chambers up. So this is a standard um, ovarial from Drosophila. It's composed of different stages. And so it's kind of like an assembly line. These are all those little egg chambers to make a mature egg. And if we split them up into different groups, so pre-9, 9, 10 to 13, 14, not really important for you. And we can do a nanostring. So this is uh, technology to then look at how many microRNAs are present and at what number within these different groups of oocytes. And what we see here, in fact, is that um, we see a number of RNAs at different counts. These are some of the highest counts. And then on the right, I'm showing you the predicted binding, if we use computer programs, for Bitcoin. And in the microRNA community, things like a, a, an 8 mer, a 9 mer, so these are regions right, in the RNA that can bind to the microRNA. Are you familiar with microRNAs? Have I, have I jumped the gun here? How, who, who wants a quick explanation of microRNAs? Nobody. No, we're good? All right. This is the part where normally then I would ask you to tell me about microRNAs. <laughs> and then the students get real quiet <laughs> and don't talk. Um, but the way the microRNAs would work, you know, they're small, 21, 22 nucleotides, they're going to bind, and they have what's called a seed sequence. And this is a sequence that's then going to be important to identifying where in the RNA to bind and to which RNAs to bind. So what we're able to show, in fact, is that using this nanostring, these microRNAs that we predict will bind to Bitcoin are, in fact, there. So that's a good first step. Now, the next step is... Can we show, in fact, that there, if there's binding, we would expect there to be protection? Right? And if our hypothesis is that the microRNA binds to Bitcoin and is whole keeping it repressed in the ovary, then in the embryo, we would expect that microRNA to be gone to allow the RNA to be translated. Right? So we should see that it's being protected, double-stranded, in some in the ovary, and then single-stranded and deprotected within the embryo. And if you want to know, I can take you through the details later. But you can see here that the embryo is, is more sensitive than the oocyte to degradation as we'd expect. And so here's just an example from this three prime untranslated region of Bicoid, where all of these examples um, for where these predicted microRNA binding sites are, the embryo is more sensitive to this degradation than the oocyte. So now, Oh, actually, let me show you one more thing. What's really kind of cool about this is 
the localization and translational control element of bicoid, which is this horrific structure here, is actually located in this region. So we actually have sites that are lying just outside of it, which means experimentally we can now start to probe these. So we've done this mapping. We've overall, we've looked at these different presence of these RNAs, and we think that these microRNAs are there, and we think that they could be binding. But the gold standard would be, can you show, in fact, that these microRNAs are bound? And what he was able to do over a long period of time uh, is pull down using a probe for the RNA and a, and a, and a bead after cross-linking the microRNA to the RNA. So he was able to actually bind, he would, he would cross-link this RNA, microRNA, RNA interaction, pull down the RNA, and then release to look at the microRNAs that came down specifically bound to bicoid. Right? So this is a, basically looking for the small RNA interactome that's been captured. Then he sequenced these uh, from this pull down, and you see the types of things that came down. So things like tRNA, snow RNAs, coding region, link RNAs, all the things you'd expect from these you know, 330 uh, 350,000 reads. But key here for what I want to tell you is the microRNAs form 2% of what he was able to pull down. And what gets us really, really excited about this is when we look at the microRNAs that came down with Bicoid, they're the same microRNAs that we saw from the original work that we were looking at from the nanostring and from these deep protection sites as well. And you can see just how enriched they are. So MIR-184, MIR-989, MIR um, LET7, which you may have heard of from C. elegans, MIR-311 and 310, which are famous ones in Drosophila. And when we go then to looking at the specific pairing sites, it gets even more exciting because this MIR-989 has a really strong seed sequence as well as this supplemental binding region. So you have a 9-mer, an 8-mer, then you have six more binding sites with a wobble, Another example here from 989, and this is now in the 3' UTR, we have a really strong seed site in the supplemental binding. So this suggests, and within the microRNA community, this is strong likelihood of binding. From this pull down, we know it does bind. So this puts us in a position now where we need to go through and make mutations in this binding. Yeah? So we're right now, we're working on not only building the plasmids to put into flies, but also CRISPRing out a number of these different bases, right? which will then tell us if we see ectopic translation of the RNA, it will start to explain then if, in fact, microRNAs are translationally regulating Bitcoin. And this would be quite exciting because it's really been something that's been ignored, not only within Drosophila, um, but a lot of different systems have previously shown, though, that microRNAs are critical, especially in C. elegans. Some really beautiful work in that system. So I think in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to get off of RNA for a second, because that's OK, because some people don't love RNA as much as some people do. <laughs> and I want to tell you a little bit about a project that we had no idea would be interesting, but has kind of drawn us in to a totally different field. Um, it's semi-related, but it's really a fascinating one. And what's going on here, and it's, this is all, some of it's published, but a lot of it's preliminary. So if you do have ideas, even off the wall ones, Throw them at me, because I love crazy ideas. Um, so what's happening between the end of oogenesis and the early embryogenesis? And you can see here in this thing, these are the ovaries. So there's one ovary, two ovaries. And these large eggs here, so this is stage 14, bicoid uh, at the anterior, nanos at the posterior. It's going to then pass into, this, into the oviduct. Then it's going to go down the oviduct. And this here, you can see this dark one, is an activated and then fertilized egg. And you can see the size difference. This egg is swelled. It's actually started up its cell cycle again. Um, what you see here is the dorsal appendage, which is a breathing tube for the embryo. But once it gets into the uterus, it's then going to be fertilized and then deposited. What wasn't known in Drosophila, which was quite surprising, was what's going on at egg activation. And classically, egg activation results in a calcium wave, or waves, depending on the system. So in starfish, in ascidians, and in mice, for example, in madaka fish in 1978, I think it was, maybe 77, they, they could first image calcium waves. 
And they're, they're really quite spectacular to watch. In mammals especially, they coordinate the cell cycle. And you see these uh, repetitive waves of calcium passing through um, these, these early eggs. But in Drosophila, when we came to this point, no one had ever looked. So they never actually had the chance, despite and, and, and the technology, to look at whether or not there's a calcium wave in Drosophila. And I assumed there had been, because I was interested in the bicoid aspects. Right? I was interested in the RNA. But then we found ourselves curious, well, maybe we should just try imaging it. <coughs> so just to briefly tell you a little bit about how female reproduction works in Drosophila, these are the two large ovaries. Here's our nice oviduct. The egg passes through and becomes activated. This activation triggers the cell cycle to turn back on and prepare for fertilization. Then when you get down into uh, the uterus, then the egg is fertilized, and it's internal fertilization from the female. So Drosophila hold the sperm in these structures that are going to be lateral or well, perpendicular called the spermatheca. And so they can hold sperm for long periods of time. And then they would fertilize the egg individually and then deposit it. And what's kind of crazy about Drosophila, it's, as a fun fact for your next cocktail party, they have the longest sperm to body ratio in the animal kingdom. And there's one in South America, if you stretch the sperm out, it is 2.3 centimeters. So get that right, centimeters, <laughs> yeah? And what's predicted in that example is that because it's uh, the way the fertilization takes place, the sperm tail acts as a block. So the, the sperm that have been come from another male can't cut the cue, yeah? It's similar to other systems where the, the male will actually deposit something that hardens inside the female, and that the next male then has to come along and pull that plug out and then inseminate. You're not a zoologist, so I'll stop there. <laughs> I get a little carried away about some of these cool things in the animal kingdom. Um, and just as one more side note, because it's going to be important in a moment, the egg itself is here. There's an egg, uh, the plasma membrane for the, for the egg, for the oocyte. Then there's a space, and then the egg shell. And the egg shell is the chorion, right, and the, the, the hard part. And the, the space in between is called the perivitellin space. And just to kind of cut to the chase for you, our lab is now thinking that the perivitellin space is what's going to allow the calcium to enter into the egg. So there's the take home pre. Um, I'm conscious of the time. Do we have to be out the door at one? Can you guys kick it for another five, seven minutes after one? Yeah. We did start 10 minutes late. As a total side story, there was a, 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 a talk in Oxford, sorry, in Cambridge, and someone came and he was Swiss. I think he was German Swiss. And it was like a beer and pizza. Six o'clock, beer, pizza. Yeah? And so it's supposed to be casual and fun. And he's standing there at 600, right? And he's sort of looking around. You know, no one's sitting down. And you can tell he's getting a little anxious. And then when everybody sits down, the speaker introduces him. You know, and it was you know, five past. Five past. And he's like, hmm, thank you. It's uh, good to be here. I'm a little concerned about the time, but uh, that would not happen in Switzerland. Uh, and everyone laughed, thinking he was joking. And he just straight face, <laughs> ice cold. And afterwards, I'm like, he wasn't joking, was he? And someone's like, nope. <laughs> so anyway, um, I just want to check. We are in Italy, though, so I will continue rambling. <laughs> I talk too damn much, too, so I apologize. Um, what we're able to do when we want to look at egg activation, um, one of the keys to be able to experiment on this is we can ex vivo activate. So we can take out a mature egg in oil. We can then put on what's called an activation buffer. And you can see that buffer is going to result in a couple of really dramatic things happening. One being the dorsal appendage stands up. You can see here there's going to be rounding at the anterior and posterior pole. And the egg is swollen quite dramatically. Yeah. So this is a way we can then very easily experimentally activate these eggs. So our first approach was to do what they had done 35 years earlier, which is inject in uh, two types of dye, one that's going to be calcium sensitive, one that isn't, and then do what's called ratiometric imaging. So you can compare the changes in those dyes, and, uh, and you can then false color. And what you'll see here is um, over time, so these are time going down this way, you're noticing that the pole at the posterior has very high calcium levels, and, uh, and that there's a wave then that moves across from the posterior pole um, towards the anterior. Now, the problem with this is we've stuck a needle into it, which means as it swells, you can imagine the cytoplasm might leave from that hole where the needle was. So it's not a great system. That's why it doesn't go on 
much further than this time point because <laughs> it's bleeding out cytoplasm. And the breakthrough then came when we were looking in the nervous system field. Some colleagues of ours were using what's called a G-CAMP. So this is a GFP bound to a calmodulin. And you might remember from, from past studies that calmodulin binds to calcium very well. And in this case, when the calcium binds to this calmodulin, it removes a protein that's quenching the GFP until the calcium binds. So that shift when the calcium binds in calmodulin allows us to get fluorescence. And we're driving this now in the Drosophila eggs. And you can see the beginning of this movie is now we see this wave of calcium moving from the posterior to the anterior. And then importantly, we see the recovery because calcium is toxic within the cell. Presumably, we believe it's now going, you know, being taken into the ER. And this is on loop, so it's only happening once. So we see a single calcium wave. And at the same time as we were doing this, a collaborator now, but a competitor then, uh, was also able to see it happening inside of the Drosophila female. So they would glue the female down, and then they would treat her with um, what's called fly nap, which if you've ever uh, done some work with, with school children, perhaps, you use fly nap instead of carbon dioxide. It's this horribly toxic, really vile stuff. But they would hit them with fly nap, and you could see then one egg moves off, and the next egg, you see this flash of calcium within the egg. So we think it's also happening in a similar way. The time scale is a little quicker, um, and I can tell you about that later if you want to hear more. But it's also happening within the female. So this compares not only to the ex vivo, but to the, what's going on in the female. A cool link then that we found between, this is why we got interested in it, between bicoid, just to give you your last RNA bit, and, uh, and calcium was what's called sera. Uh, and these are mutants. This is a, a, it encodes a calcipressin, which is important as an inhibitor of the calcium-dependent phosphatase calcineurin. None of that really matters unless you're really keen on it. But you see here, we don't see a calcium wave in a sera mutant. And interestingly, in the Drosophila early embryo, we don't see a release of bicoid RNA. So this is the wild type. You see the RNA is dispersing. In a sera mutant, you still get these large aggregates that we assume are then localized with the Peabody. So you don't get the proper translation. So this is quite an exciting link then between calcium being required then for the translational regulation. We can't prove anything beyond that yet, um, but I, I can tell you more down the future. I want to rapidly then just take you through two things. One is discussing osmolarity, and one is the cytoskeleton. So as we see this egg chamber going in, it's going to hit the lateral oviduct. Some predictions were that when it hits it, it's going to push and squeeze right, on the egg, and that could then um, cause activation of the egg. And they'd seen this in wasps. In Hymenoptera, if you pass the egg through a really narrow tube, almost like a corset, it would then cause the, uh, the activation. So just to test this, we would grab the, the egg and, and pull it into a, a tube that's used for in vitro uh, fertilization in, in mammals. And, uh, and we see, in fact, that this doesn't, and you can see this movie on loop here, it doesn't cause a wave to form. Another prediction to test was whether or not calcium was coming in from the solution, right? So this, you might say, well, you're doing an ex vivo. Everything you're doing is actually rubbish because you're adding a buffer. None of that's real. So then we would use activation buffer with BAPTA, which is going to chelate the calcium. And we can see, in fact, that we still see a calcium wave which we were happy about. To test whether or not it's a calcium-induced calcium release, right? so this is a classic if you're into calcium, you can inject calcium in where you have a local release of calcium. This can then lead to uh, a wave forming. So we injected calcium, a little bit of calcium into the egg. We don't see any wave form. We inject a bit more. In this example, we don't see a wave go. So this kind of left us of having tested a number of the different uh, mechanisms that we'd known from other systems. Um, one of the other things that we found which was intriguing was to do with mechanosensitive channels. And this would be a hypothesis where if water goes in and swells the egg, right, osmolarity, this could then open these channels. And that could then allow calcium to flow in. And this calcium that flows in, we would predict is coming from that perivitellin space. So it's within the egg chamber between the chorion and the, uh, the vitellin membrane. So to test this, we actually tried all different types of osmolarity. So we made a, a solution of distilled water and sucrose with no calcium. We could even do this with the buffer as well. 
And you can see, in fact, that at the same osmolarity here, around 280 to about 350, you see a lot of full waves shown in blue. And then when we go to really low osmolarities, you'll notice the predominant, um, active, the predominant um, uh, result is a burst. So the egg just swells, 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 and then explodes, which is quite fun. And then at a very high osmolarity, you don't get any wave because there's no swelling. So the prediction then is that it's this key osmolarity that enables us to then swell, so more water goes in, that could open these channels up. Now, beyond just looking at calcium, we also just went through quickly because we know there's a change uh, in the meiotic spindles. And so we could look at activation buffer. So here's the meiotic spindles before activation, and you notice they've changed their shape quite dramatically after. We can do the same with sucrose and water, and we get the same result. We can use a control solution, and we see, in fact, that the metotic spindles haven't changed. So this now is at least trying to build us towards what we're seeing is actually physiologically relevant. Yeah. Um, we've done all the numbers on this, but I'm not going to bore you with it. So then something I tried a week ago, first time I've shown it, so you're my uh, guinea pig audience. What we were predicting then is if, in fact, it's this swelling that's required to open the calcium channels, could we take the egg, put it in oil, then inject oil inside, right? So something that has no calcium associated, swell it from the inside, and then see a calcium wave start from the posterior. Yeah? Sort of an old-fashioned embryology-style experiment. And what you're seeing here is at the beginning of this movie, I'm going to take the needle, stick it in. You notice there's a local swell, which I'll get back to in a second. Then you're going to notice there's cytoplasm being moved about. Yeah? The cytoplasm is being... Uh, displaced, we can see that oil. I think you can kind of see it over here. There's some oil coming in there and there. And you notice then when I change the focal plane quickly that there is calcium, but it's only actually happening at the posterior, which is crazy because we didn't think this would work. <laughs> now, we weren't able to follow this wave because we had a technical issue that, that afternoon. Um, but we're now going back and we're going to try and repeat a lot of these experiments just to see, in fact, can we cause that swelling from the inside to then get us this release. The other cool thing is you notice as soon as you prick the egg, there's a local response in the calcium. And we think that could actually be this perivitellin space right there, right? And that that space is actually entering in, and that's where the calcium is, and that gives us this local burst. All right, and then the final kind of few slides are now going to look at whether or not the actin cytoskeleton is involved. So you could imagine, in fact, when you change the swelling, yeah, that's going to cause the actin cytoskeleton also change. Actin being an important cytoplasmic protein typically associated with the membrane. And this piece of data, which you can watch, this is eggs undergoing activation. Here you can see the calcium wave. And this is a label for F-actin. And I think you might be able to see also, there's a, also a wave happening that actually follows the calcium wave of the actin filaments. You might be saying, no, Tim, that's BS. I don't believe you. That's fine. <laughs> we went through, um, here, here's the stills, and we could then quantify it. And what you see, which is quite, quite interesting, is you get at the anterior, you get the calcium wave happening first here in blue, right? And then you get the uh, cortical act. Oh, sorry, no, I'm totally lying to you. This is the cortical actin happening, um, going through these sort of waves that correspond with the calcium. So they're happening just after. So then, in order to test whether or not this actin change is going to be important for egg activation, we can use activation buffer plus um, cytoclasin D, which is going to disrupt the actin cytoskeleton. And maybe you can see here that, in fact, we're not getting a full wave. This is one of the examples where uh, about 20% of the time we see these waves trying to spread from both sides. And in other examples, 50% of the time we don't see any wave at all. So uh, penultimate slide. And activation buffer only, we get a full wave 80% of the time. We can stabilize the actin cytoskeleton with phylloidin, and we see that we've lost um, that percentage of full waves. This is significant. I didn't put it on this graph. Cytoclasin D, we see the same effect. We also see the same effect with retrunculin as well. So the whole thing, which is very messy right now, the prediction is as it enters the lateral oviduct, 
there's a change in the fluid within the lateral oviduct, which is then going to result in water going into the egg. That water is then going to change the actin cytoskeleton, which will then open up these mechanical sensitive channels, and that this will then spread as we go along from the posterior to the anterior. And I realize this is hideous, um, but you might also notice there's other channels. We've been testing all of this. Obviously, no time to tell you. Just need to say thank you. This was my advisor, Liz. Um, she's still at Princeton. She's like a second mother. She's wonderful. Tudor, who's a great friend who I met in Okinawa on a neurobiology course in 2010. And we've uh, ended up at the same place and started. Um, his lab is, is, is great. He's at the WIM in Oxford. This is Bruno. Um, he's a PhD student who did all the microRNA work. I also worked with Catherine Rabui. I lived in Holland for a year doing electron microscopy. Um, she's, she's delightful. This is my postdoc advisor, Alon. This is the gentleman who did the Gherkin stuff. And this is Richard, who's been a friend forever. This is my lab and the people who I work with and the people who give me money. Thank you. <laughs>